But before the Aztecs and before the Maya, there were a culture who are referred to as the Olmecs. The settlement story of the Americas is much more complicated uh, than we've, you know, than we than we've realized. And and what the what the DNA is doing is uh, it's telling us that there was something really weird, 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 weird. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a growing fascination with ancient civilizations, particularly in the Victorian era. This interest was driven by a mix of cultural trends in exploration, colonization, and a certain romantic allure attached to discovering lost cultures. Major institutions like museums and universities, primarily in Europe and the US, started funding expeditions to unearth ancient artifacts and understand the history of indigenous civilizations in the Americas. It was a time when archaeology began to evolve from just hunting for treasures to a more scientific approach, focusing on careful excavation and detailed analysis. One of the things I've realized is that there is no classic Native American feature, that, that Na Native Americans are, uh, a very, have a very complex genetic story with very many different elements uh, br brought into it, and we shouldn't be necessarily surprised by the supposedly non-Native American look. Interestingly, during this period, many artifacts, especially the colossal heads and stone structures found in the Olmec region, were often wrongly attributed to other well-known civilizations like the Maya or Aztec. This was largely because the unique aspects of Olmec art and iconography weren't immediately recognized, partly due to a lack of an overall framework to understand the region's history before Columbus. A couple of notable explorers, John Lloyd Stevens and Frederick Catherwood, played a significant role in stirring up interest in Mesoamerican cultures with their explorations and writings, particularly their books on travels in Central America and Yucatan. Their detailed accounts and illustrations captured the public's imagination, sparking a wave of interest in these ancient cultures. While they mainly focused on the Maya, their approach to systematically document their findings and blend travel narratives with scholarly observations greatly influenced future archaeologists studying Mesoamerica. Uh, it's been known by archaeologists for quite a long time that there are anomalous skulls uh, in parts of Brazil, uh, which appear to show uh, very strongly Polynesian or African features, very much like the features that we see mm. on, the, on the Olmec heads. Around this time, there was also a trend in comparative archaeology, where discoveries from different parts of the world were compared, helping to place Mesoamerican civilizations in a global context. Museums began to transition from just storing artifacts to becoming centers of research and education, playing a crucial role in spreading knowledge about ancient cultures. This era also marked the start of interdisciplinary approaches in archaeology, integrating fields like anthropology, linguistics, and early forms of environmental science. This broader, more inclusive approach helped in piecing together a more comprehensive understanding of ancient civilizations, including the intriguing and complex Olmec culture. Back in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, when Western archaeologists were exploring Mesoamerica, they started coming across these massive stone heads. Some of them were over nine feet tall and weighed several tons, with distinctive features like flat noses and fleshy cheeks, often adorned with helmet-like headgear. But here's the thing. Despite their impressive size and unique features, their true cultural significance wasn't immediately understood. They're most famous for is these huge carved human heads, uh, which can be on a scale of up to 20 to 25 tons, which have curious features, which have been interpreted variously as Polynesian, African, don't look like classic uh, Native American features. One of the earliest significant findings was made by Jose Melgari Serrano in 1862 at Tres Zapotes in Veracruz. He unearthed what we now know as one of the first Olmec colossal heads. Melgari Serrano even described the head as having Ethiopian features, which tells us a lot about the perceptions and biases of that era. But, and this is crucial, his discovery didn't really spark a broader understanding of the Olmec culture right away. For a long time, these heads were seen more as intriguing oddities rather than pieces of a larger cultural puzzle. It took several decades and a lot more digging before the significance of these heads truly began to be appreciated. Initially, many people thought these artifacts might belong to other known civilizations, like the Maya or Aztec. 
because the idea of the Olmecs being a distinct early Mesoamerican civilization hadn't quite taken shape yet. It wasn't until the mid-20th century, with more systematic excavations led by archaeologists like Matthew Sterling, that the true picture began to emerge. They found more colossal heads and other artifacts, and this really helped to establish the Olmecs as a significant and influential civilization in their own right, predating and possibly even influencing others like the Maya and the Aztecs. Back in 1945, a really important expedition took place, led by this guy named Matthew Sterling. He and his team headed to San Lorenzo, right in the heart of what was once Olmec territory. This wasn't just any random adventure, it was a big deal because the Smithsonian Institution was backing it. They saw the potential in figuring out more about the Olmec sites, which could really shed some light on Mesoamerican prehistory. Before Sterling got there, there had been some poking around in the area, mostly because people kept finding these huge stone heads. These finds were intriguing but didn't quite give the full picture. So enter Sterling. He was already pretty well known in archaeology circles and had a real knack for Mesoamerican cultures. He was the perfect guy to take on such a complex task. Now, it wasn't an easy job. The San Lorenzo site was in this tropical area, covered in thick jungle. Just getting to the site and starting to dig was a huge challenge. They had to clear a bunch of jungle without messing up any artifacts that might be hiding there. And let me tell you, the weather didn't make things any easier. It was humid, unpredictable and not the best for keeping ancient artifacts in one piece. The site itself was huge, spreading out over several kilometers. Sterling and his team had to figure out where to start digging because there was no way they could cover the whole area. They did an initial survey which took a lot of time and planning and then decided on the most promising spots to start excavating. They had to be super careful with how they dug things up. The artifacts were old and fragile, especially with the humidity. Plus, they had to keep track of everything they found, where they found it, and all the details, which was crucial for understanding the site later on. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. What they found at San Lorenzo was amazing. It turned out to be one of the oldest big cities in Mesoamerica, dating way back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's even before civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs that most people are familiar with. The artifacts they unearthed, especially those massive stone heads, were a big deal. They were carved from single blocks of basalt and had all these unique facial features. It was clear that the people who made them were incredibly skilled. All this hard work at San Lorenzo really helped piece together the story of the Olmecs. It gave us a clearer timeline and showed just how complex and advanced their society was. Diving deeper into San Lorenzo, which is super important when it comes to understanding the Olmec civilization, it's considered the oldest major city in Mesoamerica, dating back to around 1200 to 900 BCE. That's way before other famous civilizations like the Maya and Aztecs. Radiocarbon dating was key here. It helped archaeologists nail down the timeline of the site, giving a much clearer picture of when the Olmecs were doing their thing. Now, the most famous stuff they found at San Lorenzo definitely the colossal heads. These huge sculptures were carved from single basalt blocks and are known for their unique facial features like almond-shaped eyes and broad noses. A lot of them have these intricate headdresses too, which might have been a sign of high status or had some ceremonial purpose, but there's still a lot of debate about what all the symbols mean. The size of these heads is just mind-blowing. Some are up to three meters high and weigh around 50 tons. Imagine the skill it took to carve those. But it wasn't just the heads. They found jade figurines and a bunch of different pottery styles, which tell us a lot about their daily life, art, and even trade. The jade stuff suggests they had trade networks because jade wasn't just lying around everywhere. And the buildings. They found large structures like platforms and what might have been houses for the elite. This points to a society that was really well organized and had the resources to build big. The way San Lorenzo was laid out is also fascinating. It had a central axis, which indicates that the city was carefully planned. There were separate areas for ceremonies and living, showing a sophisticated urban structure and hinting at a social hierarchy. All this stuff from San Lorenzo has been super important for understanding the Olmecs. It's given us a much clearer timeline of their civilization and shown just how complex their society was. The variety in the artifacts, from the colossal heads to the pottery, shows that they were not only skilled in stone carving, but had artists and craftsmen who were really good at what they did. 
It's like San Lorenzo has given us a window into a past world, showing us how these ancient people lived, worked, and created. After the exciting discoveries at San Lorenzo in the 1940s, archaeologists turned their attention to La Venta, another key Olmec site in Tabasco, Mexico, in the 1950s. This shift was a big deal because La Venta offered a new window into the Olmec world. Known as one of the earliest complex societies in Mesoamerica, the explorations here were more focused and methodical, thanks to archaeologists like Philip Drucker and Robert Heiser. These guys weren't just digging around, they brought in techniques from other fields like anthropology and geology, giving a fuller picture of the Olmec civilization. La Venta is super important for understanding the peak of Olmec culture. The site was in its prime from around 900 to 400 BCE, a time when the Olmecs were really showing off their artistic and architectural skills. One of the standout features of Leventa is the Great Pyramid. It's not like the pyramids in Egypt, this one's made of earth and clay and has a unique conical shape. It was one of the biggest structures in ancient Mesoamerica at the time, which tells us the Olmecs were pretty good at organizing big construction projects. The pyramid was probably more than just a big building, it's believed to have been a key spot for ceremonies or religious activities, kind of like the heart of Olmec ritual life. The way they built it and other structures at Leventa, and how they aligned them with astronomical bodies, shows they were pretty savvy with engineering and astronomy. It was likely a bustling cultural hub, where significant ceremonies and gatherings happened. When archaeologists started digging at Leventa, they did things a bit differently than before. They were super systematic about it, focusing on layers of soil and the context of each artifact they found. But they had their work cut out for them. The tropical climate and the fact that many Olmec structures were made of earth really made preserving and understanding these finds tough. They had to be meticulous in recording everything they dug up, which has been a gold mine for future analysis. Now, just like at San Lorenzo, La Venta is famous for its massive basalt heads, Carved from huge boulders, these heads are thought to be representations of Olmec rulers or other big shots in their society. But there's more. The site is full of altars with intricate carvings, showing people, animals and all sorts of symbolic scenes. It's like getting a glimpse into their mythology and rituals. And then there's the jade. Leventa turned up loads of jade artifacts from beautifully carved figurines to Celts. These weren't just pretty things to look at. They showed how skilled the Olmecs were and hinted at long trade networks, since jade wasn't just lying around nearby. But here's where it gets really interesting. The burial sites they found were complex, with all kinds of elaborate practices. They also found mosaic pavements made of serpentine and various offerings, which likely had deep religious meaning. All this stuff from Leventa has been super important in piecing together who the Olmecs were, their social structure, religious beliefs, and artistic talents. However, keeping Leventa in good shape for future studies is a challenge, the site's battling both natural elements and human factors, so preserving this amazing place is crucial, not just for archaeology buffs, but for understanding a key part of human history. But what's fascinating about them is they are, they are supposedly the first high civilization of Central America, that they create structures on a massive scale, that you can see connections between them and the later, the later Maya. For the Maya, the Milky Way was a particularly important feature of the heavens. They conceived of it as the road that led to their netherworld, Zibalba. In the verdant lands of Central America, the ancient Maya civilization flourished with a mysterious brilliance that continues to captivate the world. Among the many enigmas they left behind, their profound understanding of astronomy stands as a testament to their intellectual prowess. Graham Hancock, a modern explorer of ancient mysteries, delves deep into this aspect of the Maya, proposing intriguing theories that stretch the bounds of conventional history. That whole mystery of the Mayan calendar was clearly inherited from the Olmecs. It wasn't something the Maya made up. The Olmecs used that same symbolism. So the Mayan calendar is actually an Olmec calendar. Maya long count calendar, a marvel of ancient engineering, intricately tracked a 5,125-year cycle with astonishing precision. This calendar wasn't just a tool for marking time. It was a complex understanding of celestial cycles, intertwining the Maya's daily lives with the cosmos. Hancock suggests that this precision hints at a deeper, possibly inherited, knowledge of astronomy. Was this sophisticated understanding a legacy from a much older, now lost civilization? 
When one looks at the grandeur of Maya structures such as the pyramid at Chichen Itza, the brilliance of their astronomical alignment is striking. During the equinoxes, the play of light and shadow on this pyramid creates the illusion of a serpent slithering down its steps. To Hancock, these architectural marvels are not just buildings, but celestial maps, echoing an advanced understanding of the cosmos. Orion was extensively involved in Mayan rebirth beliefs, which described the constellation and specifically its three belt stars as the turtle of rebirth. In Egypt, as amongst the Maya, the stellar context involves Orion and the Milky Way. The Maya's awareness of the ecliptic, the path followed by the sun, moon, and planets across the sky, further fuels Hancock's theories. Their ability to predict solar and lunar eclipses and track the movements of Venus, which they revered as the god Kukulkan, showcases their deep astronomical knowledge. Did they learn this from an older civilization? Hancock wonders. A civilization lost in the depths of time. Hancock theorizes that the Maya might have been part of a vast network of ancient civilizations, sharing knowledge across seas and continents. This global maritime culture, as he envisages, could have been a conduit for transferring advanced astronomical and architectural knowledge to the Maya. The architectural designs of the Maya, seen in their pyramids, temples, and cities, reflect a level of technological and engineering skill that seems almost ahead of their time. Were these skills handed down from a previous, more advanced civilization? The mathematical systems of the Maya, including their use of zero, a concept rare in the ancient world, were integral to their astronomical calculations. Hancock proposes that this mathematical sophistication, too, might be a legacy from a forgotten civilization. We're not what it's all about at all. Uh, that there may have been an earlier civilization that reached a high level of advancement, perhaps different from ours, but nevertheless an advanced civilization, which was just taken out of the story completely by a global cataclysm. In a tale woven from the threads of ancient mysteries, Graham Hancock, a modern-day seeker of lost truths, presents a fascinating theory. He imagines a world where an advanced civilization predating the ancient cultures known to history, once thrived. This civilization, possibly flourishing before the last ice age ended around 10,000 BCE, was a beacon of knowledge in fields like astronomy, architecture, and mathematics. Hancock's story tells of a society whose influence stretched far beyond its own time and space, touching various corners of the ancient world, including the enigmatic Maya civilization. I think, and it's my case, that it wiped our memory of a previous episode of, of human civilization, that right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. However, this ancient global society in Hancock's story faced a dramatic and catastrophic end. He hypothesizes that a cataclysmic event such as a comet impact or a massive flood nearly obliterated this civilization. But not all was lost. The survivors, carrying the torch of their advanced knowledge, ventured out into the world. These bearers of ancient wisdom found their way to other, less advanced societies and shared their knowledge, planting the seeds for new civilizations to grow. Among these were the Maya, who, in Hancock's view, may have been one of the many inheritors of this ancient legacy. Hancock points to the Maya's remarkable architectural and astronomical achievements as evidence of this influence. The precision of their calendar systems, their understanding of celestial cycles, and the alignment of their buildings with astronomical events are, in his narrative, not just the fruits of their own ingenuity but possibly a heritage from a civilization lost in the mists of time. He draws parallels between the architectural styles, religious beliefs, and astronomical knowledge found across various ancient cultures, suggesting these similarities might be remnants of a shared source of ancient wisdom. Because we now know that at that time, between 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, truly global cataclysmic events involving rapid rises in sea level yeah. uh, did occur, and suddenly the, the worldwide tradition of a, of a global flood stops being just a myth and starts being a memory. In a narrative that intertwines the mysteries of ancient seas with the Maya calendar, Graham Hancock, a storyteller of history's hidden chapters, brings to life his theories of a bygone era. He paints a picture of an ancient world, 
not fragmented by vast oceans, but connected through them. This world, according to Hancock, was home to a sophisticated global maritime culture. This culture, adept in the art of navigation and shipbuilding, embarked on extensive sea voyages, knitting together the far-flung civilizations of the ancient world. Hancock's tale is not just about the movement of ships, but also about the flow of ideas, technologies, and beliefs. He sees the similarities in architectural styles and construction techniques across different ancient cultures as whispers of a shared knowledge, possibly disseminated through this maritime network. In this story, ancient seafarers are the unsung heroes, ferrying not just goods, but also the seeds of culture and religion across the world's watery expanse. He draws parallels with the Polynesian navigators, known for their remarkable oceanic voyages, suggesting that similar capabilities could have existed among these ancient maritime cultures. They're telling us that uh, this lost civilization was submerged in a great flood around 11,600 years before our time. This is why I think we need to pay attention to the Atlantis story rather than just write it off as the ravings of the lunatic fringe. But Hancock's narrative takes an intriguing turn as he touches upon the mysterious Maya civilization and their long count calendar. This calendar, a sophisticated timekeeping system, tracks a cycle of approximately 5,125 years, culminating in a date that modern calendars align with December 21st, 2012. Hancock, weaving a tale from the threads of time, views this not as an apocalyptic end, but as a significant moment in Maya cosmology, a marker of major transition or transformation. In this story, the 2012 phenomenon is not a tale of doom, but a moment of cosmological significance, possibly indicating a shift in human consciousness or the dawn of a new era in human history. Hancock uses this moment to discuss the broader concept of historical cycles, how ancient civilizations understood and measured time, and their alignment with astronomical events such as the precession of the equinoxes and the galaxy's alignment. Graham Hancock, a modern-day chronicler of lost civilizations, presents a captivating theory. He tells a story of Earth's history punctuated by cataclysmic events, asteroid impacts, massive floods, and volcanic eruptions that have periodically reshaped the course of human civilization. In this tale, these cataclysms are not just natural disasters, but pivotal moments that lead to the rise and fall of civilizations, causing a reset of human progress. The Amazon Basin is 7 million square kilometers in area. And within it, 5.5 million square kilometers remains almost entirely unstudied by archaeologists. We've done world archaeology, but we've just ignored the Amazon. What we find in the Amazon are thousands of henges that are now beginning to emerge from the cleared area of the jungle and others that have been identified for the first time with LIDAR. Discoveries of ancient civilizations in the Amazon jungle have unveiled a complex and sophisticated history that challenges previous assumptions about the region. These discoveries, made through a combination of aerial surveys, satellite imagery, and ground expeditions, reveal the existence of large, well-planned urban settlements, extensive road networks, and advanced agricultural techniques suggesting a much higher level of social organization and environmental management than previously thought. The Kuhikugu complex in the upper Xingu region of the Brazilian Amazon offers an incredible glimpse into the advanced urban planning and societal organization of pre-Columbian civilizations long before European contact. Nestled in the remote Amazon basin in present-day Mato Grosso, Brazil, this area is a treasure trove of biodiversity. The dense rainforests and network of rivers likely played a key role in the development and sustenance of this complex society. Covering about 50 square kilometers, the Kuhikugu complex is home to over 20 settlements. These aren't just randomly placed, they're strategically positioned to make the most of the region's natural resources. What's fascinating is how these settlements are connected. Imagine a series of straight roads, some stretching for several kilometers, laid out with such precision that they often align with the cardinal directions. This not only facilitated travel, but also shows a high level of planning and coordination. Then there's the canal system, an impressive display of hydraulic engineering, likely used for everything from transportation to water management, and maybe even fish farming. 
The variety of structures within the complex is equally remarkable. From large public buildings and ceremonial spaces to individual homes, the architecture reflects a hierarchy in building techniques, hinting at different social or functional roles within the society. And speaking of society, estimates suggest that at its peak, Kuhikugu could have supported a whopping 30,000 to 50,000 people. This is deduced from the sheer number of residential structures and the expanse of agricultural land along the Amazon, he reported seeing incredible cities, advanced arts and crafts, millions of people, a thriving culture. Uh, the rediscovery of the Kuhikugu complex in the Amazon is a fascinating story that blends modern technology with traditional archaeology. Initially, this hidden gem was revealed through aerial surveys and satellite images. Imagine flying over the dense Amazon rainforest and suddenly spotting the outlines of an ancient civilization. Then, archaeologists like Michael Heckenberger and his team took over, conducting extensive ground excavations. They employed advanced techniques like LIDAR, which is like X-ray vision for archaeologists, to see through the forest canopy and map the area accurately. Now let's talk about how old this place is. Using carbon dating, a method to tell the age of artifacts and soil, scientists figured out that people lived in the Kuhikugu complex for several centuries, dating back to as early as 800 AD. They found all sorts of things like pottery, stone tools and ornaments, giving us a glimpse into the daily life and creativity of the people who lived there. Here's the kicker. Before finding Kuhikugu, many thought the Amazon was mostly an untouched wilderness before Europeans arrived. But this discovery turned that idea on its head, showing that the area was home to a large and complex society. It's like finding a hidden chapter of history in your backyard. This place shows us that humans had a big impact on the Amazon, way earlier than we thought. They even made their own super fertile soil called Terra Preta, which is still rich and productive today. What's really cool about Kuhikugu is how it shows that the people there knew how to live sustainably. They had advanced farming practices, managed water well and lived in harmony with their environment. It's like they were eco-friendly before it was trendy. This discovery also made us rethink the role of indigenous societies in the Amazon. It turns out they knew a lot about how to manage the land and shape the landscape. It's a reminder of how important it is to value and learn from indigenous knowledge. And lastly, the biodiversity in the Amazon today might partly be thanks to these ancient civilizations. The variety of plants near these archaeological sites is way more than in other areas of the forest. The Amazon is basically a garden. The Amazon is a man-made rainforest. Uh, there are certain trees like Brazil nut trees or the ice cream bean tree, which are food crops, which are very, very valuable. Marajo Island at the Amazon River's mouth is like a time capsule that takes us back to the Marajoara culture, a sophisticated civilization from around 800 to 1400 CE. Imagine an island almost as big as Switzerland, right at the meeting point of a river and the ocean. This place, with its mix of forests, savannas and wetlands, is not just big but also incredibly diverse. It's the perfect backdrop for the Marahuara people to thrive, providing everything from food to resources for their unique lifestyle. Now, the Marahuara culture is something special. They were known for their artistic flair, especially their ceramics. Picture pots and plates with intricate designs, complex patterns and images of animals and people. They weren't just making these for fun. Their ceramics were a big part of their culture and beliefs, like the large, beautifully decorated urns they used for burials. These suggest they had quite complex ideas about life, death, and everything in between. But it's not just their art that's fascinating. They built these massive earthen mounds, some over 10 meters high. Think about that. That's like stacking three buses on top of each other. These mounds were probably used for everything from homes to ceremonial sites and might have even protected them from the frequent floods. This shows they were pretty savvy engineers and architects, adapting to their challenging environment in style. The way they organized their society was also quite something. It seems there was a clear hierarchy, with some people leading the way in managing resources and religious practices. And they had different roles for men and women which we can figure out from the things they left behind. Now let's talk about their farming skills. They were ahead of their time, creating raised fields to keep their crops safe from flooding. Their diet was a mix of what they grew, along with fish and game from the surrounding area. And they were smart about managing water with their canals and ditches, which was pretty crucial in a place that floods a lot. 
Santa Rem, right where the Tapajos meets the Amazon River, is a fascinating place, especially when you think about its history. This spot was like the Grand Central Station of its time, bustling with trade and culture. Picture boats coming in and out, carrying all sorts of goods and ideas from different parts of South America. The area around Santa Rem was rich in resources, which helped the settlement thrive. Now, the people of Santa Rem were known for their incredible pottery. We're talking about really intricate designs here, geometric patterns, pictures of people and animals, and even mythical beings. The level of detail in these pots and plates is just mind-blowing. And it wasn't just about looking good. These designs tell us a lot about their culture and beliefs. The way they made this pottery was pretty advanced too. They had techniques for molding, firing and painting that were way ahead of their time. The variety of colors and the way they used glazes show they really knew their stuff when it came to chemistry and kiln construction. It's like they were the master chefs of pottery, knowing exactly how to cook up the perfect piece. Santa Rem was more than just a local market. It was a cultural hub. The different styles and motifs in the pottery suggest they were mixing it up with all sorts of cultures. And it wasn't just goods they were trading. They were probably swapping stories, ideas and practices too. The town itself, from what we can tell from the ruins, was pretty well organized. They had different areas for living, working and probably for community gatherings or ceremonies. It's like they had their own little urban planning going on. But back to the pottery, it's not just about how it was made, but what it tells us about the people of Santa Rem. It gives us a peek into their daily lives, what they valued, and how they connected with others. The geoglyphs in the Amazon, especially in the Brazilian states of Acre and Rondonia, are like a secret world that's been hidden under the dense forest canopy for centuries. It wasn't until the late 20th and early 21st centuries, mostly because of deforestation, that these incredible earthworks started to come to light, thanks to technology like satellite imagery and LIDAR, which is basically like having X-ray vision from space. Over 450 of these geoglyphs have been mapped. This discovery has completely changed our view of how people lived in the Amazon before Columbus. Now these aren't just a few lines in the dirt. We're talking about huge designs that can stretch over a kilometer and cover several square kilometers. They come in all sorts of shapes, circles, squares, rectangles, and more intricate forms. Some even have patterns like radial spokes which add to their complexity. The sheer size of these geoglyphs hints at a society that was really well organized and could bring together a lot of people to create these massive works. But how did they make them? Well, they would remove the top layer of soil and vegetation, revealing the lighter colored earth underneath. One thing that they used to say is, Hancock can't be right because there was no global cataclysm, you know, 12 or 13,000 years ago. Well, now we know there was, and there are various explanations for it. Right at the epicenter of this cataclysm was a civilization that we would regard as advanced, not a simple hunter-gatherer civilization, which was utterly wiped out uh, in this cataclysmic event. Graham Hancock's interpretation of the Piri Race map, created in 1513 by the Ottoman admiral and cartographer Piri Race, presents a fascinating narrative about the knowledge of ancient civilizations. The map, discovered in 1929 in the Topkapi Palace in Istanbul, Turkey, has only about one-third of its original content preserved. Despite this, the map's detail and coverage, including parts of Europe, North Africa and the Brazilian coast, are noteworthy. The scale of the map is inconsistent, a common feature in early cartography, and it includes various annotations and illustrations. This is a very neglected area of the world, uh, as far as deep and ancient archaeology goes. If you're going to propose a lost civilization, you need, there are certain preconditions. Piri Reis himself indicated that the map was compiled using various earlier sources, including charts from Christopher Columbus and possibly older maps, which might have included Western and Eastern, including Arabic navigational charts. Hancock's interpretation of the map primarily focuses on its depiction of the Antarctic coastline. He claims that the map shows the northern coastline of Antarctica in a largely ice-free state, which, according to him, last occurred more than 6,000 years ago. This assertion, if true, would imply a significant historical anomaly, suggesting that ancient seafarers might have charted Antarctica long before it was officially discovered. However, this interpretation is contentious. Critics argue that the so-called Antarctic coast could be a misrepresentation or misinterpretation of the South American coast, or even an imaginative addition, not uncommon in early cartography. 
In 1513, when Piri Reis uh, drew the map, Antarctica had not been discovered. Uh, in fact, it wasn't discovered until 1880 by our civilization. It incorporates highly accurate relative longitudes. To do longitudes accurately on maps requires a chronometer, a marine chronometer that will keep accurate time at sea. And again, this was something that our civilization couldn't do until the late 18th century. Another intriguing aspect of the Piri race map, according to Hancock, is its accuracy in longitude in certain sections. He posits that this level of accuracy indicates a more advanced knowledge of navigation and geography than what was available at the time. However, this claim is debated by scholars who argue that the accuracies could be coincidental or exaggerated since accurate methods for measuring longitude were not developed until the 18th century. Hancock also suggests that the map depicts mountain ranges in Antarctica, which were unknown and under ice until recent times. This, he believes, further points to ancient knowledge of geography. Critics, however, counter that these features could be inaccuracies, such as misdrawn coastlines or symbolic illustrations, rather than representations of actual geographical features. Graham Hancock's hypothesis about advanced ancient knowledge, particularly as seen through the lens of ancient maps like the Piri Rice map, certainly stirs up a conversation about our understanding of historical and archaeological knowledge. Hancock points out that these maps display a level of geographical detail that seems remarkably accurate, especially when you consider the time they were created. For example, the Piri Race map, which includes detailed coastlines and island locations, seems to suggest a level of knowledge that surpasses what was known or should have been possible at the time. It's quite intriguing, really. One of the more captivating aspects of Hancock's theory is the suggestion that some of these maps show features that were not officially recognized until much later. Well, this map was drawn in 1813. It's the Pinkerton world map, um, and it's based on the latest science available in 1813. So Antarctica isn't there. Why isn't Antarctica there? Because it's an honest map. They hadn't discovered it in 1813. So it's very odd in my view that Antarctica appears on much older source ma maps, which themselves are based on even older source maps. Um, Take, for instance, his interpretation of the Antarctic coast as depicted on the Piri Race map, a region not known in the 16th century. This leads Hancock to speculate that these maps could have been based on even older sources, possibly from a forgotten civilization that had extensively charted the globe. It's as if he's hinting at a lost chapter in human history one that recorded the Earth with surprising accuracy and detail. When we dive into the technological implications of his theory, things get even more interesting. Hancock suggests that the creators of these original source maps must have had advanced navigational skills, including the accurate measurement of longitude. A significant challenge that wasn't resolved until much later with the invention of marine chronometers in the 18th century, the precision in these maps, particularly in terms of latitudinal and longitudinal readings, implies a level of cartographic sophistication that seems out of place in the historical timeline as we understand it. It's as if these mapmakers had tools and knowledge that history says they shouldn't have had. Graham Hancock's ideas about the loss and transmission of ancient knowledge are quite captivating, weaving together a narrative that stretches across time and civilizations. He proposes that a wealth of geographical knowledge, once possessed by an advanced ancient civilization, was largely lost due to cataclysmic events or perhaps the gradual decline of this civilization. It's a, it's a navigational device, it's, uh, it, it, it's a geared, cogged uh, mm. system that allows you to track the passage of time and figure out where you are. Again, that testifies to a lost navigational skill that, yes. we, that we have not taken account of. Before. It's a thought-provoking idea, suggesting that what we know of our past might just be the tip of the iceberg. Hancock believes that some remnants of this knowledge managed to survive and eventually influenced the cartographic work of later civilizations, including those in the medieval and renaissance periods. Hancock delves into how this information could have been passed down. He suggests a variety of channels, including oral traditions, mythological texts, and even surviving cartographic materials, which later mapmakers like Piri Reis might have used. Imagine, for a moment, ancient mariners passing down stories of distant lands and seas, with these tales eventually finding their way into the maps and charts of later generations. One of the more intriguing aspects of Hancock's hypothesis is his connection with myths and legends from different cultures around the world. 
He often draws parallels between these stories and the idea of advanced prehistoric knowledge and global cataclysms, such as the great flood narratives found in many cultures. In Hancock's view, these myths and legends aren't just fanciful stories, they're potential historical records, allegorical but based on real events and knowledge from these lost civilizations. It's a narrative that challenges us to think beyond conventional historical accounts, suggesting that our ancestors might have known far more about the world than we give them credit for. You see, the, the, the one thing there's no dispute about anymore uh, is that the Younger Dryas was a cataclysm. The, 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 the megafauna that, uh, that, that die off, the disruption of human activity that takes place at that time, the huge climate changes, this was a cataclysm by any standards. Where the argument still goes on is what caused the, what caused the cataclysm. Graham Hancock has this really interesting, if somewhat controversial, hypothesis about a global cataclysm that he believes occurred around 10,600 BCE. He suggests that Earth was hit by a comet or a series of comet impacts at this time, leading to massive environmental and climatic upheavals worldwide. This idea is particularly interesting because he links it to the Younger Dryas period, a well-documented era of abrupt climate change that started around 12,900 years ago and lasted for about 1,300 years. The Younger Dryas is known for a sudden shift back to colder and drier conditions following a period of warming after the last ice age. Hancock posits that this comet impact could have been the trigger for this dramatic climatic shift. What's intriguing is how Hancock uses ice core samples from Greenland and Antarctica to support his theory. These ice cores, which provide a detailed record of past temperatures and atmospheric compositions, show evidence of a rapid climatic change during the Younger Dryas. He sees this as a smoking gun, indicating a major impact event. He also points to geological evidence like sediment layers that show signs of sudden environmental changes, further supporting his comet impact theory. We see all the megafauna dying off suddenly and rapidly. We see rises in sea level. We see a huge collapse in, in global temperature. What is becoming clearer and, and clearer uh, is that the evidence that a comet behind it was behind it is, is extremely strong. But Hancock doesn't stop there. He goes on to suggest that this hypothesized comet impact had profound effects on both flora and fauna, including contributing to the extinction of many large mammal species during what's known as the Pleistocene megafauna extinction. The changes in vegetation and ecosystems, he argues, would have had cascading effects on wildlife and human populations alike. For human societies, Hancock believes this event was catastrophic, causing significant disruptions and leading to the loss of advanced knowledge and cultural practices of prehistoric civilizations. It's like he's suggesting a kind of cultural amnesia, where societies forgot the advancements they had made. And then there's this fascinating idea that survivors of this cataclysm might have passed on fragments of their advanced knowledge to other cultures, influencing the development of future civilizations. It's a narrative that makes you wonder about the connections between ancient civilizations and how knowledge could have been transferred across generations and geographies in ways we might not fully understand. The people in Egypt, they believed in what's called Kemet, the people that existed before the Egyptians. When we hear these stories about the Great Pyramid being a tomb for the Pharaoh, it's worth mentioning that even the locals didn't believe that. Once upon a time, as the last ice age retreated and the Earth began a dramatic transformation, the stage was set for a narrative that would challenge our understanding of human history. This was a time of global climatic shifts, marked by rising temperatures, melting ice and rising sea levels. Human societies, which had thrived as hunter-gatherers during the chill of the ice age, began to spread across the planet. This period, known as the Mesolithic Era, saw the dawn of permanent settlements and the beginnings of agriculture. But according to the intriguing and controversial Kemet theory, this era also witnessed the rise of something extraordinary in the Nile Valley. The Great Pyramids and their relationship to the River Nile reflect the sky of 12,500 years ago, not 4,500 years ago. The proponents of the Kemet theory weave a tale of an advanced civilization, one that allegedly emerged amidst these climatic upheavals. This civilization, they claim, was not just advanced for its time, but possessed knowledge and technology that would leave later societies in awe. Their mastery, it is said, extended across various domains. In the realm of astronomy, the people of Kemet supposedly had an intricate understanding of celestial bodies. They could track astronomical events with precision, 
knowledge that they might have used to develop sophisticated calendar systems and guide their agricultural activities. The Great Pyramid is an incredibly complicated monument, but those who, those who built it had an enormous knowledge of which, they, which they manifested in the Great Pyramid. But their expertise did not end with the stars. The architectural marvels of ancient Egypt, such as the pyramids, are believed by adherents of this theory to be remnants of this earlier, more sophisticated civilization. Further, this mysterious civilization is credited with extraordinary advancements in medicine and mathematics, and perhaps even in fields of energy and physics that modern science has yet to rediscover. The legacy of their knowledge, it is suggested, was far-reaching. The proponents of the Kemet theory point to various pieces of evidence to support their claims. They observe geological anomalies that mainstream archaeology might overlook or interpret differently. For instance, the erosion patterns on the Sphinx and certain features of the pyramids are argued to be much older than the established timeline suggests. The Great Sphinx was subjected to about a thousand years of heavy rainfall and that's the only time you find that heavy rainfall on the Giza Plateau is the Younger Dryas. Between roughly 12,800 and 11,600 years ago, you certainly didn't find it 4,500 years ago when the Sphinx was supposed to have been made. Proponents cite water erosion marks on the Sphinx, which they claim point to a construction date that predates the aridity of the Sahara Desert. Moreover, the theory draws on mythological and cultural parallels. It notes similarities in ancient myths, religious practices, and architectural styles across different cultures. These similarities are interpreted as echoes of a shared source of ancient wisdom, potentially originating from Kemet. According to the narrative of the Kemet theory, after a catastrophic event, the survivors of this advanced civilization dispersed globally. This diaspora, the story goes, spread their advanced knowledge far and wide. This could, as the theory suggests, explain the sudden rise of complex civilizations and monumental architecture in various parts of the world. In the annals of alternative historical narratives, the Kemet theory stands out as a captivating tale of a civilization steeped in mystery and marvel. This story begins with the assertion that an ancient civilization, referred to as Kemet, once flourished with knowledge and technologies so advanced that they remain incomprehensible even to contemporary science. The echoes of this lost civilization are believed to be found in the monumental achievements of ancient Egypt, particularly in the realms of astronomy and engineering. In the realm of engineering, the pyramids, especially the Great Pyramid of Giza, are often presented as the pinnacle of Kemet's architectural prowess. The mystery of the construction of the Great Pyramid, which contrary to archaeological views, has never been solved. Right. Nobody knows how it was done. I mean, you are looking at 6 million tons, 13-acre footprint, 481 feet tall, 2.5 million blocks of stone in its construction. How'd they do it? Nobody knows. How it was done. The theory marvels at the precision and scale of these constructions. It questions how the ancient Egyptians of later periods, with their known tools and technologies, could achieve such feats. The meticulous alignment of the pyramids to true north, the transport and assembly of massive stone blocks and the use of advanced mathematics, including pi and the golden ratio in their design, are all highlighted as indicators of a superior technological capability. Venturing further into the realm of speculation, some proponents of the Kemet theory suggest that this civilization might have harnessed unknown forms of energy or technology. Ideas range from the use of acoustics and vibrations for stone cutting and levitation, to more esoteric notions involving the manipulation of electromagnetic fields or other unseen natural forces. The dawn of the early dynastic period heralded a monumental shift Egypt, which had been divided into upper and lower regions, was unified under the rule of King Nama, a seminal event immortalized on the famed Nama Palette. This unification gave birth to the first dynasty and set the stage for a cultural renaissance. Hieroglyphic writing emerged, a sophisticated system that allowed for intricate record-keeping and administration. Royal tombs, grand in their design, began to dot the landscape at Abydos and Saqqara, Religious practices grew more elaborate, with gods like Ra and Osiris gaining prominence, and the first pyramids, like Djoser's step pyramid designed by Imhotep, began to reach towards the heavens. The Old Kingdom, often hailed as the Age of the Pyramids, saw the construction of these iconic monuments reach its zenith. What happened was that in later times, the ancient Egyptians, who were the inheritors 
of the culture that originally established the Giza Plateau, that the ancient Egyptians found it necessary to restore and modify some very ancient monuments. The Great Pyramid of Giza, a marvel of engineering and architecture, stood as a testament to the pharaoh's godlike status. Art and culture flourished with the Sphinx of Giza, a colossal statue combining the body of a lion with the head of a pharaoh, embodying the period's artistic audacity. However, this golden age was not to last. Political instability and the decentralization of power eventually ushered in the first intermediate period, a time of decline and turmoil. Out of chaos, the Middle Kingdom arose, a period marked by reunification and stability under rulers like Mentuhotep II. Literature and art saw a renaissance, with works like The Tale of Sinuhe, reflecting a more realistic and individualistic portrayal of life. Trade expanded, and fortifications were strengthened, signaling a kingdom more secure and prosperous than ever. The new kingdom heralded an era of empire building, with Egypt's influence stretching from modern-day Syria to Sudan. This was the age of famous pharaohs like Hatshepsut, Akhenaten, Tutankhamun, and Rameses II. Akhenaten's radical attempt at religious reform, introducing monotheistic worship of Aten, marked a brief but significant departure from traditional beliefs. Architectural achievements reached new heights, with the construction of grand temples at Karnak and Luxor, and the creation of the Valley of the Kings. Following the New Kingdom, Egypt entered a period of decline. The Third Intermediate Period was characterized by political fragmentation, and the late period saw foreign invasions and rule by Nubians, Assyrians, and Persians. The final phases of ancient Egyptian civilization were under the Greek Ptolemaic dynasty and Roman rule, marking the end of a civilization that had lasted for... But uh, what they don't like is the notion that, that certain knowledge and information accumulated by that culture was passed down all around the world, uh, so that you find the same essential ideas in Mesopotamia, right. in ancient Egypt, uh, in the Amazon rainforest, in Mexico, in Guatemala, amongst the Mayan culture, for example, the same essential ideas are being repeated. The traditional Egyptology timeline reveals a civilization of incredible depth and complexity. From their architectural feats to the intricacies of their religious beliefs and social structures, the ancient Egyptians left an indelible mark on human history. Their story, woven into the fabric of the Nile's fertile valleys, continues to captivate and enlighten, a testament to the enduring legacy of one of the world's most remarkable civilizations. In the tapestry of human history, woven with the threads of established facts and intriguing mysteries, the Kemet theory presents a fascinating narrative. Central to this story is the concept of a global cataclysm, linked to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis which is believed to have had a profound and lasting impact on human civilization, particularly on a sophisticated society known as Kemet. The stage for this narrative is set against the backdrop of the Younger Dryas, a period that occurred around 12,800 to 11,500 years ago. This era was marked by a sudden and drastic cooling of the Earth, interrupting the gradual warming that followed the last Ice Age, the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis posits that this climatic anomaly was triggered by a comet or meteor impact, or possibly multiple impacts, around 10,900 BC. The hypothesis suggests that these cosmic collisions led to widespread fires, the creation of a dust cloud that blocked sunlight, and a resultant rapid return to cold conditions. Proponents of this hypothesis point to geological evidence like nanodiamonds and microspherules found in sediment layers as signs of this ancient cosmic event. From the perspective of the Kemet theory, this cataclysmic event is seen as the pivotal factor in the downfall of the advanced Kemet civilization. The theory suggests that the catastrophic events unleashed by the impact led to widespread destruction and loss of life, resulting in the rapid decline and eventual disappearance of Kemet. The envisioned aftermath includes massive fires, dramatic climate changes and ecological disasters that would have been devastating enough to erase much of the civilization's technological and cultural achievements. This was the 12,800 years ago was the onset of the Younger Dryads, which is a, a, a catastrophic climate episode, uh, which is where, where, where the Earth has been emerging quite slowly and almost pleasantly from the Ice Age and then suddenly goes back into a dramatic deep freeze. 
In the wake of this disaster, the Kemet theory weaves a tale of survival and transmission. It suggests that the survivors, carrying with them the advanced knowledge of Kemet, dispersed across the globe. These survivors, according to the theory, had a significant influence on the development of other ancient civilizations. This is often cited as the reason for the striking similarities observed in architectural styles, mythological narratives, and astronomical knowledge across various ancient cultures. However, this captivating narrative is not without its challenges and debates. One of the contentious points raised by proponents is the erosion patterns observed on the Sphinx at Giza. They argue that these patterns suggest a much older date of construction, potentially aligning with the timeline of the Kemet civilization. This claim, however, is highly debated among Egyptologists and geologists, with many attributing the erosion to known climatic and environmental factors of a later period. Similarly, questions raised about the conventional understanding of pyramid construction techniques are used to support the theory's claim of more advanced technology. Critics, on the other hand, argue that the methods proposed by mainstream archaeology are plausible and consistent with the available evidence. The theory also draws on mythological and architectural parallels across different ancient cultures, interpreting these similarities as evidence of a shared ancient knowledge base. Mainstream scholars, however, typically view these parallels as examples of convergent cultural development or shared human experiences and archetypes, rather than proof of a single disseminated ancient wisdom. It's definitely a hall of records containing uh, a sort of time capsule from a forgotten episode in human history. What is concealed there touches on the fundamental mystery, the mystery of the immortality of the human soul. The concept of the Hall of Records is an intriguing blend of mysticism, archaeology, and speculative history, largely stemming from the visions of Edgar Case and the theories of Graham Hancock. Edgar Case, known as the Sleeping Prophet, was an American clairvoyant who claimed to access a wealth of knowledge in a subconscious state. During his trance-like states, Casey spoke of a Hall of Records, a repository containing the wisdom and history of a long-lost civilization believed to be Atlantis. This mythical island nation, famously mentioned in Plato's dialogues, was, according to Casey, a hub of advanced technology and spiritual knowledge. Casey had no apology for the limits of his psychic ability, though he continued to make world predictions he never considered himself a prophet. Casey's visions placed one of these halls beneath the Sphinx in Egypt, suggesting it held records from Atlantis, including cosmic knowledge and advanced technologies. He also mentioned two other locations, one underwater near the Bahamas and another in the Yucatan region, linked to the ancient Maya. His description of Atlantis painted it as an advanced civilization, aware of its impending doom, who created these halls to preserve their knowledge for posterity. Enter Graham Hancock, a writer known for his alternative historical narratives. Hancock has been deeply interested in the Hall of Records, seeing its potential discovery as supporting evidence for his theories of a prehistoric advanced civilization. I think the key thing is we're, we're looking at technologies that are not the same as ours. Yes. And that's yes, partly that's why point. archaeologists can't see them, because they're looking for us in the past, and they're not open to the possibility that there are whole other kinds of technology that could be used. He believes this civilization existed during the last Ice Age and was lost to a global cataclysm. For Hancock, the Hall of Records isn't just a mythical concept, but could be a real repository of lost knowledge. He speculates that it might contain detailed astronomical data and advanced technologies that could challenge our understanding of ancient civilizations. Hancock's theories suggest that such a discovery could bridge the gap between myth and historical fact, providing tangible proof of a once globally influential civilization with profound knowledge in astronomy and architecture. We're looking at the clues that lead to specific locations. That shaft which led to that doorway was always a clue. The opening of that shaft was sealed until 1872. The last five inches of stone over the mouth of that shaft had been left deliberately in place. Now moving on, the discovery of the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion off the coast of Egypt has been a remarkable window into the past, unveiling a wealth of information about the ancient world. Located strategically near the canopic mouth of the Nile, north of Abukir Bay, Thonis Heracleion was a pivotal maritime hub. 
Its position was crucial for navigation and commerce, bridging the Nile River with the vast Mediterranean Sea. The city, with its natural harbour shielded by a chain of islands, thrived as a major port, a testament to its urban and architectural prowess as indicated by the remnants of a network of canals, docks, and temple complexes. Rediscovered in the early 2000s, Thonis Heracleion had been submerged and lost for centuries before French underwater archaeologist Frank Godio and his team, employing advanced techniques like sonar scanning, brought it back to light. This monumental discovery, made in collaboration with the Egyptian Ministry of Antiquities, ensured that the findings were well documented and preserved. The utilization of cutting-edge technology in underwater archaeology has been pivotal in mapping the city's layout and recovering artifacts, offering us a clearer picture of its past. Dating back to at least the 12th century BC, Thonis Heracleion was more than just a city. It was a bustling hub during its heyday in the late Pharaonic and early Greco-Roman periods. As a significant commercial center, it played an integral role in the Mediterranean trade network, dealing in goods like grain, papyrus, precious metals and spices. But its significance wasn't limited to trade alone. The city was a cultural melting pot, blending Egyptian, Greek and Roman cultures. This amalgamation was reflected in the diverse range of artifacts unearthed, including statues and inscriptions, showcasing various artistic styles and cultural influences. The city's religious significance cannot be overstated. With its large temples and sanctuaries dedicated to numerous Egyptian gods and goddesses, Thonis Heracleion was a spiritual beacon, especially known for hosting the annual Mysteries of Osiris rituals. Politically, too, it was a powerhouse, serving as a primary entry point for foreign diplomats and traders to Egypt, and playing a crucial role in international relations. Its administrative significance was also marked, given its role in tax collection and governance. The Society for American Archaeologists claimed that they could absolutely for certain be sure that there was no lost civilization during the Ice Age. They knew it was a fact, and if there had been any civilization, they would have found it, right. and they would have published it. The archaeological treasures unearthed from the sunken city of Thonis Heracleion have been absolutely incredible each offering a unique glimpse into the life and times of this ancient Egyptian city. For starters, the discovery of over 64 ancient shipwrecks is remarkable. It's not just the number that's impressive, but also their state of preservation. These wrecks are like time capsules, giving us a real sense of the maritime activities that once buzzed in this port. They tell us about the shipbuilding techniques of the era, how these vessels were designed, constructed, and the materials used. The diversity of ships, from grand cargo vessels to smaller boats, paints a picture of a bustling harbour engaged in a wide range of maritime endeavours, and the cargo remnants, including amphorae and various trade goods, speak volumes about Thonis Heracleion's extensive trade network. Then, there are the anchors, about 700 of them. This is unheard of in underwater archaeology and speaks to the sheer scale of the port's operations. The size and design of some of these anchors suggest they were used by large, heavy ships, showcasing the port's capacity and technological prowess at the time. The materials used, stone, metal, reflect not just the resources available but also the level of craftsmanship and maritime technology of the period. The statues they found are simply awe-inspiring. Imagine coming face to face with a 16-foot tall statue underwater, these statues, representing gods, goddesses, pharaohs and perhaps significant city figures, give us a window into the religious and political life of Thonis Heracleion. Made from granite and diorite, they're not just huge, they're also beautifully crafted, a testament to the city's wealth and its cultural significance. Gold coins are another major find. The substantial quantity of coins discovered indicates the city's economic prosperity, these coins span across various eras and rulers, providing a timeline of the city's prominence and its connections in trade. They're solid proof of Thonis Heracleion's active role in regional and international trade networks. There are, you have to be careful when you look at underwater structures. You have to look at all the conditions that have led to their submergence. And, and in some cases, it's very clear that they've been underwater for a very, very, very long time indeed. Thonis Heracleion is like a treasure trove for anyone fascinated by ancient civilizations. The way this city was laid out tells us so much about the people who lived there and their advanced understanding of urban planning. They had a network of canals, roads and buildings, all systematically arranged, which is pretty impressive when you think about how old this city is. 
These canals were crucial for transport and trade, functioning like water-based roadways. It's amazing to imagine boats navigating these waterways as part of daily life in the city. Then there's the city's architecture, particularly its temples. Thonis Heraclean wasn't just a trading hub, it was a religious center too. The temples there were dedicated to various deities like Amun and Heracles, showcasing the religious diversity of the time. These weren't just simple structures, they were architecturally grand with large columns, statues and intricate carvings. It's fascinating to think about how these temples were not only places of worship, but also centers for social and cultural activities. They played a significant role in the daily life of the city. The city's role as a cultural hub is further highlighted by the artifacts found there, which show a blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman influences. I think we're looking at something from Alexandria here. Yes. Yeah, we are. We are. I've dived there as well. That's inundated not because of sea level rise, but because of subsidence of the Nile silts. Uh, Moving on to more underwater locations in Egypt, Cleopatra's palace in Alexandria is truly a fascinating subject, especially when you dive into its location, historical context, and the treasures it held. Nestled in the eastern harbor of Alexandria, the palace was not just any royal residence. It was located in the most prestigious part of the city, known as the Royal Quarter. This was where the heart of political and cultural activity in the Ptolemaic period beat the strongest. Now think about Cleopatra Sevevan, the figure to whom this palace belonged. She was the last pharaoh of the Ptolemaic kingdom, renowned for her intelligence, charisma, and her liaisons with figures like Julius Caesar and Mark Antony. The palace, from its architecture to its contents, was a reflection of her power and prestige. Imagine a grand structure combining traditional Egyptian and Hellenistic architectural elements with lavish decorations and intricate detailing. It wasn't just a place to live, it was a statement of power and culture. The palace was probably filled with lush gardens and courtyards, offering a peaceful retreat in the midst of a bustling city. And given Alexandria's reputation as a center of learning and scholarship, it wouldn't be surprising if Cleopatra's palace housed extensive libraries and study areas. This would have been a place where the intellectual elite of the period gathered. The grand reception halls in the palace would have been venues for diplomatic events and political discussions, playing a crucial role in the international politics of the era. The artifacts and architectural elements discovered from this palace are like pieces of a historical puzzle. Statues, possibly depicting Cleopatra, Ptolemaic rulers and Egyptian gods, made from materials like granite and basalt, give us a glimpse into the artistic excellence of the time. The columns and other architectural fragments found at the site tell a story of opulence and artistic fusion, where Greek and Roman influences blended with Egyptian motifs. And then there are the sphinxes, symbolizing royal power and religious significance, perfectly illustrating the cultural synthesis that was characteristic of the Ptolemaic period. These discoveries are not just about Cleopatra's personal tastes. They provide a deeper understanding of the Ptolemaic society during her reign. The blend of Egyptian, Greek and Roman elements found in the palace's architecture and artifacts reflects the rich cultural diversity and exchange that occurred under Cleopatra's rule.